Oh, bird. He's always, he's got an Eeyore vibe, but not completely suicidal. Hey. If you woke hey, up from a deep... bird. No. no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's like someone like in a trench coat and you notice that you hey, see their bare legs underneath and you're like, hey, oh, psst. back off. Hey, big bird. No. <laughs> Check out my trunk. <laughs> oh, you drew eyes over it? That's weird. You want to do it? Wait, what am I doing? Welcome to Your Inner Child is oh. an Idiot. This is the podcast where we look back <laughs> on things from our childhood and see if they're any good. My name is DJ. One day I will get the format correct. I'm Damon. <laughs> We're going to talk about follow that bird when the, the fine folks at Sesame Street come to the big screen. Yes, their first uh, foray, I almost had said foyer, um, that's different, um, <laughs> first into, foyer. into the big, into the big Everybody screen. remembers their first foyer. You I got the little just... bowl where you can put your keys, maybe spare that's change, so nice. maybe there's little a little chandelier. Uh, have you ever seen this movie? Yes, and at the time, when I was little, my aunt had HBO and we did not, so I remember we got VHS recorded off of my aunt's HBO follow that bird and i think it was also a, the heathcliff movie or any a oh. heathcliff show that was like also on there mm-hmm. so i remember see you know like what was the hbo the old hbo theme that is still currently the hbo theme don't they just go no if you get a feature presentation on hbo if you're like watching something like in the prime time that's what comes on before a movie begins now if you're watching curb your enthusiasm or last week tonight you get the (laughs) that's different but you still get the me and tyler like to scream it as loud as possible when a movie plays that's the jam that is a jam. No, it's good. And I love that it doesn't resolve. It just keeps rising. And then it's, and yeah. it's like, I guess the movie will resolve this. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> leaves you, it leaves you like, it like throws you off the cliff into the movie. And so you're yeah. like, yeah. And right, then you realize you're this. watching that King Kong movie that just came out somewhat recently. Uh, it's like that apocalypse now. Bad. Get out of here. <laughs> da, da. Oh, yeah. And then you go into the O. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. You got to go into the O, baby. The H is O. Here, I'm going to send it to you because you got to jam Please do. Man, I forgot about the drums. That that really makes it. All right. I'm pulling it up now. I do remember this where you go into the... I see now what you meant by into the O. (laughs) Yes. This this last thing with the title card, I have that on... so loud now. (laughs) Sorry. The last thing with the title card, I have that like going from tracking at the very beginning of like a a taped recording of uh, of it. I know that doesn't have much to do with all that bird, but that's... One could even argue nothing. (laughs) But that's the main thing I remember is the intro and then getting into it. And I remember loving this movie and big bird was always my dude i uh was into i think you and i would be the right age right before the reign of elmo i remember elmo being a very periphery character yes when i was a kid and now he seems to like rule over that place with an iron fist yeah he became despotic ruler and it's really like the suge knight of sesame street he's got the whole like fidel castro thing where he came in and he was like you know of, of the people he yeah. came, you know, from, uh, he was us. He was representing us. And then he just became another despot, you know. Yeah, it was rule. just like, this is just the same thing, you know, army greens jacket. Yeah. What happened with Elmo? Like, wh- how did that happen? I know, like, like obviously, like, Tickle Me Elmo was, like, the biggest toy ever, but he was big before that. Like, that's why. Yeah, I mean, he, I, I remember him, like, he, he started to have a personality when I was maybe about to age out of Sesame Street. Like, yeah. I remember being, like, kind of into him at the end of my Sesame Street career. Whoa, okay. <laughs> but, like, he, he was, like, very cute and always, like, very uh, childish. Right. Uh, much more than the other, like, Muppets. That's what, he, like, came on, like, in the maybe mid-80s. Is, uh, I don't but there was a what... documentary a few years ago before Kevin Clash uh, fell from grace right? about Kevin Clash and how his career at, at Sesame Street. And he was just pretty much like he wanted to have a, a Muppet that like had a person on. They were like, here, we've had this one in like background shots, but no one's ever done anything with him if you want to figure it out. And okay. that's when Elmo became a thing. 
Okay. Is Elmo in this? I think I you remember. see him briefly, like, yeah. in it. I remember I watched this movie when it came out. I was super excited. I was a very Sesame Street kid, and my brother was very Mr. Rogers. Not at the same time, because there's six years betwixt us. But right. Jason very much liked to tell me that I was too old for Sesame Street at every opportunity he got. <laughs> and uh, I think I just liked the fact that they were Muppets. I liked this yes. whole system yeah. that they had yes. sorted right. out there. <laughs> I remember seeing this movie in the theaters and being very excited about it because it had a different look than the show did. It felt very much, much more like up- upscale Sesame Street than the, the show did. Right. And, and then Bigger I budget. think... Yeah. And They're I like, think they probably got a better set. I think they like do angles on the on the in the movie that you don't see in the show. Yeah, I don't remember a lot, but do you get like a like cut scene? Like they cut from the regular show, and you get to see them like walking off what you would normally see as the yeah yeah. yeah. Like, the, you see yeah. the whole street rather than right, just like right. this weird little corner. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah, but I uh, I remember I I didn't see it for a while, and I think in college we went through that phase of just like, oh, we, have you seen this movie? Have you seen this movie? And like, uh, you know, when you make all your new friends and you're comparing, you know. Toxic nostalgia to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we made a podcast about it. <laughs> Me and my friend Jeff were uh, reminiscing about Follow That Bird, and I think we rented it and we watched it and realized it's amazing and oh. that it makes me cry like a lunatic at Uh-oh. the end because okay. big bird gets kidnapped oh he gets, jesus spoiler jesus <laughs> he gets kidnapped painted blue and sold oh, to a circus right. as the bluebird of happiness and he sings what may be the saddest song ever put to paper it is so sad. But uh, I remember I, when I rewatched it, I realized that all the songs are kind of good in this movie. So I think we're both going to love this movie and appreciate the magic that That's was uh, the Henson uh, production company or whatever. I remember th- there's like the ostrich lady with like the brow, right? Yeah. She wants to get Big Bird out of his home on Sesame Street and put him in with birds to raise him. Because uh, she mm. thinks it's unhealthy that he's the only bird on on Sesame Street. She is played by Sally Kellerman, who has a very distinctive raspy voice. She made her name on. I'm trying to remember if she was in the movie version of Mash or if she's on the show version of Mash, but she's one of those. Hot Lips Houlihan. Yeah, she plays Hot Lips Houlihan. One iteration of her, I can't remember okay. which. I think she's in the movie version. She is played by Donald Sutherland in the movie. <laughs> Alan Alda in the show. There are a lot of cameos. I think Kev- Chevy Chase is in this uh, briefly. I was going to say, um, are, I don't know why I he- started with Chevy Chase, who we've established as an asshole. <laughs> but there are a lot of famous people in this. You know, like famous people pop up on Sesame Street anyway. What is there a show like that now that like, because like every, everybody would be like, if Sesame Street called, they'd be like, yeah, of course. <laughs> and like, I feel like, you know, SNL used to be like that. It's not quite as anymore. There's, they get plenty of celebrity walk-ons, but like, there's like, the, you know, people are just like around. So they're I like, think yeah, the Simpsons is also kind of like this. I think it's yeah. good to be around forever. And then the people who grew up watching you then yeah, want right. to be on you. Right. <laughs> That got really complicated. I, for think, like, I think you'd be surprised <laughs> at your phrasing. <laughs> Let's unpack that, what you just said, because <laughs> that is some weird family dynamic implications. And okay. They grew up watching you, and then they want to be on you. It's pure, pure Freudian. I mean, look that up in a book. Yeah, so that's why like REM would suddenly show up on fucking Sesame Street right, yeah. later on. But it's like, it's so much more involved to have like a Simpsons walk on, you know, like, cause they have, you know, it's been weeks and months animating you. Whereas like, true, literally you just walk by and then let the Muppets do the talking. If you're you just Paul have Simon to, you just have to <laughs> sing one, two, three, four, Feist comes on and sings one, two, three, four. It's pretty much writes itself at that point. <laughs> she knew what she was getting into when she wrote <laughs> I wonder if she like wrote that song now. She's like, this is going to fucking get me on Sesame Street. <laughs> We're going to watch Follow That Bird. You can get it on HBO Max right now. So we're going to watch that. We'll be back in a little bit. We we need to do another ad for our own. Oh, my God. Of course, it never ends with these ads. We're just. Am I getting a free podcast? in the system. We're in the cogs in the 
clock of capitalism. Do I get a promo code for our podcast that maybe yeah. I could get a, get it for a, a, a small discount? Yeah. If you enter patreon.com slash your inner child's an idiot into your browser, oh. that will bring you to a place where for just a dollar up to as many infinity dollars as you want to give us, <laughs> you can be a patron of the show. Wow, that is a yeah. great deal. What a deal. You can get your names written, uh, written credits. You can get your name uh, read uh, by us at the $5 level. You can get a drawing by you. You can get a song by me. You can get... Uh, we'll come up with something else. We need to come up with something else. We need another and, level. And all I need to do to take advantage of this deal is to type uh, a uniform resource locator into my address bar on my preferred browser. Once again, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure... Ooh, very Colon, nice. Backslash, backslash, World Wide Web, period. Patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. Oh, sorry. Patreon.commercial slash yes, thank your you. child is an idiot. Do you think that I, so when we heard that song, I now remember that song, but do I remember it just because <laughs> they say that same thing about 42 times in that song? In that song? Or, or am I actually remembering it from childhood? Uh, you know, uh, memory is a tricky thing. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, do you and remember, do you remember your own name just because you're just so used to hearing it? Do you want to recap this movie? I'd love to. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Uh, uh, it it opens it opens with a patent parody, which is something that every kid loves. They yeah. love George C. Scott's oeuvre. Then it cuts to a fun animation, which gives us all the studios that were involved. We learn that uh, this movie is brought to us by the letters W and B, like Warner Brothers. I oh, didn't even put that together. I just thought they were... And then we cut to another opening to this film. It's pretty much The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey, where it starts three times. You're like, when's the plot starting? We start at the organization called The Feathered Friends, and they've, they've become aware of of Big Bird in some capacity. <laughs> I'm not sure what that process is. If there's like a government agency, are they linked to, you know, the Department of Homeland Security or what? But you they become aware through of a him. letter writing process. <laughs> you gotta get ten thousand signatures. But they have become aware of Big Bird. They're concerned that he is not around other birds. Mm. And so they find an adoptive family, the Dodos, uh, and send Mrs. Finch, voiced by Sally Kellerman, to get him. Tyler, by the way, I want to point out, he reminded me that Sally Kellerman was the voice of Hidden Valley Ranch when we were growing up. Oh. Because he just kept saying, is that the salad dressing lady? And I was like, you need to be in a conservatorship. <laughs> and then he showed me a video on on YouTube, and I was like, oh, that is Sally Kellerman. Yes, I apologize. Lawyers, back off. Leave Tyler alone. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Finch places him with the Dodos, who are uh, all the way in Illinois. Sunnyside or something. Oceanside? What is it? Oceanside, Ocean. Illinois. Uh, yeah. I assume a, a, a suburb of the Chicago area. <laughs> They are terrible. <laughs> they are morons. They don't seem to understand how to run a lawnmower. They don't understand. They're dodos. They yeah. They're 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 stupid. Like the the previously extinct dodos. Big Bird soon realizes this isn't the place for him, so he runs away. He had a family all along, and encounters many celebrities on the way, including outlaw country star Waylon Jennings, uh, who is a turkey farmer transporting turkeys across the. Across the, this great land of ours, <laughs> um, he hitchhikes with him. He meets up with some kids on a farm, seemingly have no parents around. Then realizes that Miss Finch is hunting him all across the the country. Eventually, his friends back at Sesame Street realize he's run away, so they go on searching for him. He gets kidnapped by a fun fair run by Dave Thomas and John F John Flaherty. It's Flaherty, but wasn't he the dad from Freaks and Geeks too? I know they're both SCTV guys, but yeah. John Flaherty, I think. Uh, prove me the wrong Sleaze. as I keep going. The, the Sleaze, Sleaze Brothers, Brothers Fun Fair. They kidnap him, paint him blue, uh, and he sings a heart-rending song. And, uh, but eventually his Sesame Street friends find him and uh, rescue him from the Sleaze Brothers. Joe Flaherty. Um, 
Joe Flaherty. Sorry, my apologies to the uh, Flaherty estate. Is he dead? I don't think so. <laughs> no, he's alive. <laughs> Like Catherine, all all SCTV <laughs> people for me are dead. So Catherine O'Hara has a memorial MVP award, as does Joe Flaherty has an estate. Eventually, the Sleaze Brothers are brought to justice by another SCTV alum, John Candy. And uh, all we're missing at that is Andrea Martin and Eugene Levy. And then I think we got a full house on SCTV. Yeah. <laughs> what else do we need? And then Big Bird's back home in Sesame Street. And everything seems to be hunky-dory. Miss Finch is shown that a found family can be just as good as a, a biological family. It's good that he's around cows and, and grouches and people and counts and, and a gay couple. The, the family you choose is the family... Something, something. That sings the blues. Da, 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 da. Uh, and also, uh, most importantly, Count Von Count counts the credits. There are 200, yes. I believe, and 78 credits near the end. Yeah. It's very charming. And that's Follow That Bird, I think. Did I do a good job? Yay. I, I did write it. My, my first note is five minutes in, I've choked up at every scene. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Was, uh, when he says goodbye to Snuffle Up, guess. Oh, yeah. You have to be a fucking yeah. monster. That's that's the shit right there. Oh, Snuffy. Bird. Oh, burn. I, now I'm, I finally remember his voice. I think we were trying it in the intro. <laughs> and I immediately remembered the, as soon as it came on, uh, the Oscar, uh, the Grouch patent parody. The Grouch I, uh, I, National I rem- Anthem. I am, memories came flooding back of, of loving it. Did not catch the patent reference as a child. <laughs> You didn't sure. get to see Patton. Your dad didn't show you Patton. I'm sure my a, dad. I'm sure my, my parents like my mom was like, you can't show him Patton too early. So wait until he's 12. And I'm yeah. sure my dad every birthday was like, one more year closer to Patton. Here we one go. More year. I didn't remember that there were multiple grouches. Yeah, I think when we were kids, I remember the the lady grouch sometimes would okay. come up and yeah. she sort of hangs out at Hooper's store during the story, hanging out with that other kid who's like, I don't know how he's able to keep track of uh, the progress everyone's making, but yeah. there's that, the, the children, by the way, the are map. insanely adorable in They're this. They were cute. made in like a mid eighties laboratory. They were all given those like nondescript sports Jersey t-shirts that just have like yeah. the number eight on them. And there's yeah. no affiliated team, and they're all, like, super adorable. Yeah. Uh, but that Lady Grouch, I don't know her name, but I remember her. And I, I think there were occasionally, like, gr- the, like there would be a Grouch convention in town or something, <laughs> and all the Grouches would be there or something. <laughs> yeah, I guess they were a race. I guess, you know, in Middle Earth, they'd be considered a race, <laughs> like an orc or, or man or elf. They also have, like, Oscar also has, like, a little kid fan club he's got like they've got little like trashy like white shirts and then they're wearing like trash can lids and they're all I like did, four I years did have old memories flooding back of that as so well that he had like sort of like grouch i think they're grouch kateers or something like that grouch scouts That's something so to that cute. effect it was very cute they had those little trash can lids and i i i was like going through an acid trip just or acid flashback when i saw that i was like oh my god as a like very lawful good child i uh <laughs> did not appreciate oscar the grouch as much as i do as an adult where i'm like i get this this really funny just like just his whole shtick of just like reveling and in, in dirt and the kid and the kids being into it i was just not that kind of kid where i was like oh no i was a seems, total press i was like that seems he has awful. elephants in there get out of here his best friend's a worm gross no uh, I did like, uh, he gets some of the best lines in the movie where uh, when Big Bird's leaving and he says goodbye and Oscar goes, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> yeah. And also I forgot that he called Maria, he had a thing with Maria and he called her skinny. And uh, when, oh. when she's assigned to his car, he says, it's you and me skinny. And she like is put out. I don't know what that means, but I think it's charming. I like... It's probably sexist, but I like it when people are called skinny or something, or I don't know. It seems very 1930s to call another person skinny. Hey, Slim, what are you doing? (laughs) Get out of here. You got lead bullets in your shoes? Get walking. (laughs) That wouldn't be that heavy. Yeah, I guess not. I I mean, it'd be heavier than not having lead bullets in your shoes. That's true. It depends on how many you've got. 
in there. Yeah, I'd like to see the numbers, and 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 if I could just get the weight of one bullet, I can do the math from there. Right. Yeah. Or have you step on a scale where I put bullets in the other one just in a pile? <laughs> While we're talking about Oscar, we might as well skip ahead to the other highlight of Oscar's participation, which is he goes to like it's like Oscar's like dream diner. Well, like oh my when they're God. on the road. <laughs> They go like Sandra Bernhardt's the uh, the server, and it's just like pure chaos, just like slop, and everybody's really rude to each other. It's amazing, and I I remember being skeeved out as a kid for the same reasons as we were talking about. All the uh, all the re- all the menu items are like spaghetti with like molasses and yeah. topped with um, what was it pickled maraschino cherries. It oh right. it sounded so gross. It reads like a Michelin star restaurant now, but at the time <laughs> At the and Sandra Bernhardt is playing like this very quiet, spoken at first, like sort of Bostonian uh, waitress. She's like she's sort of got a nasal voice, and she's sort of almost too quiet. You think that the uh, sound is wrong uh, in the movie, and you're like, I can't hear a word she's saying. And then she says, ta- like Maria is disgusted by all the menu items, and she says, and we have a toss salad. And Maria's like, a toss salad is that. That sounds normal. There's no, there's no like, you know, garlic, you know, garlic jelly on top or something. And Sandra Bernhardt, she suddenly changes and goes, what are you, some kind of a wacko? <laughs> and just, just screams at her. And then, of course, I mean, you see it coming a mile away. Yeah. Uh, the joke they is catapulted. They, they, they catapult yeah. the salad to your, to your table. I thought that was great. And then they, of course, it turn, when they start catapulting salads, it becomes a whole food fight and it's just chaos. But. And for some reason, Telly and the honker who are also in, in Oscar the Grouch's car are outside. They don't want to come in, but they watch through the window. It's very odd. Yeah. I couldn't place why that was the choice that was made. But let's pour one out for Telly. He was a big deal when I was a kid. And I think he got, he, he was lost in the, uh, in the great Elmo takeover okay. of Sesame Street. Because he looks kind of like Elmo. Like he looks like a stretched out Elmo. That's probably Yeah, I think his it. I think I related to him cuz his his main personality trait is just anxiousness. <laughs> so <laughs> that I related to that as a child. So I, I feel like we've lost a lot of Telly in in the intervening years and I just want yeah. to say I remember you Telly. You're good. You're a good kid. Or old oh, man, I, old I man? it's hard yeah. to place the ages on monsters. I have to get your opinion on this. <laughs> This Please get me on the record on whatever hot, this is. Hot button topic, Bert and Ernie. Yeah. Are they a gay couple? Well, according to the, one of the guys who created them, he says he based it on him and his partner. But I don't, I don't know. I always everyone, get annoyed when, on, yeah. when people nowadays are like looking back on this, this thing from their childhood and like, those people were gay. And then someone's like, yeah, they were. And I'm like, they were not. You'd stop it. You're everyone just trying to be a this, thing now. Uh, everyone on this show for toddlers <laughs> is, is sexless. Let's just. <laughs> Absolutely. They are not having intercourse with anybody. So if you identify with. Yeah, well, with them, that is wonderful, and you feel less judged, and I think that even in the 80s, which for a TV show, even for children, is pretty remarkable, they have a very diverse cast, they had, like, you know, pretty equal in all senses, and, like, men and women, and different races, even the different, like, puppet races, if you want to call them races, <laughs> like, they're, it's extremely diverse, and I, you know, that that's by design, and I don't think necessarily even even with that diversity in mind that they were like we need a gay couple they were like but if the guy was like hey i'm gonna model this on a couple like it's it's great because Bert and ernie were always my favorite but like i didn't ever think about that you know i, mean? I always but, again as a kid full of anxiousness i always felt bad for bert that <laughs> right yeah <laughs> that uh I ernie was so chaotic <laughs> yeah but we both agree that ernie's the top if they are gay Oh, he's absolutely. Oh, yeah. I did enjoy... (laughs) I did enjoy... uh, There was another running joke with Bert and Ernie that I had forgotten about, but when they're flying in a biplane that Ernie... (laughs) That's a good Somehow bit. has. It's a good bit. They're flying upside down. And of course, Bert is completely uncomfortable with this. And he just wants Ernie to fly it correctly. But this was a common like trope in Bert and Ernie skits was like Ernie being silly and Bert being uncomfortable until Bert got comfortable enough to be silly too. And then immediately uh, Ernie would be annoyed that, that yeah. Bert 
was being silly and not taking things seriously. And that's what happens here is that Bert starts singing about flying the plane upside down, and living in an upside down world. And Ernie said, we lost big Bert <laughs> because you were singing about being upside down. <laughs> It's like and they. It made me it's laugh. like he takes it too far, Bert. You always yeah. take it too far. <laughs> I love it. it they're, uh, they're the. They're probably my favorite thing about this, about Sesame Street, and about this movie. I did see in the one of the early shots where you get a wide shot of the the titular street. You see Bert on top of the roof, and you see all his pigeons. He keeps pigeons. Oh, you remember how Bert loved pigeons? Yeah, loves them. Did you, did you like, uh, this was probably too early to like identify as a, as a gay man. Like, no, I was just like, uh, they're just friends. They don't even share a bed. I didn't know what gay men were. I know. Like at this age, I wasn't, I am straight. I like girls. I was like, ew, girls. (laughs) Right. My takeaway is also, well, actually, no, I was like, girls, they're all right. What's the big deal? I've got a question for you. Yes. Does this officially make super Grover canon? Can Grover just, literally fucking fly? fly? <laughs> yeah, I guess I, n- I never really... I also have to be honest, and, and uh, Lauren said this too, I get this character that Grover... The Super Grover character and the whole Gonzo thing confused. I confused them. Like, Lauren literally was like, is that the guy from the Muppets? Like, do they just trade characters? I was like, no, Kermit's the only crossover. That's Grover. Grover is... <laughs> Uh, and also i am the monster at the end of this book exactly which was my one of my favorite books growing up but it is very similar like is because gonzo's thing was like daredevil he gets shot out of a cannon and crashes into something but grover can literally fucking just fly right not, uh, not imagination i mean i always took the super grover thing as as a uh he's a playing around like he's imagining him being a superhero because right. he would always right. jump and then fall down and his cape would always land on top of his face yeah and he wouldn't know what was going on. But here it's just like, fuck it. He flies now. He flies. Yeah, and can keep was... up with cars in doing yeah. so. Yeah. He flew across the United States <laughs> from New York to Western Illinois. I have a soft spot, though, for Grover. He's great. I, could, I don't know if I could actually place what his character is, but he's always yeah. sort of cutesy and soft-spoken, and maybe I identified with that. He would sometimes get really frustrated. Again, I would identify with that. And, you know, I also liked... There was a, like, recurring skit where he was the waiter at a restaurant, and there was <laughs> that blue guy who would always get Grover as his waiter. Do you remember this? Yes. <laughs> and, he, and Grover was the absolute worst. Yeah, And I think they would even sometimes get meta and that guy was like, oh, finally, I'm trying a new restaurant. And then Grover would come out of the back and he's like, no, not you again. I don't remember what the bit was, though. I, it no, would always be like the up. guy would order something. It was almost like an Amelia Bedelia type deal. He would order something and then I think uh, uh, Grover would take it too literally and bring okay. him something ludicrous. I'm going to find I'm going to find. And I think there was always like he it was almost like the Luigi bits in. <laughs> I, in the yeah, Simpsons, I was just where he say would that. yell yeah. something into the kitchen as he was heading back. Bring some uh, red sauce for the ugly kid. <laughs> <laughs> Good Grover. It's uh, it's a very funny funny bit. No, I, I we we caught that episode uh, and I laughed really hard because I had forgotten about put yeah. some more of the red crap for the ugly kid. It made me laugh so hard because I had forgotten he, that Bart goes back after he breaks up with Principal Skinner. Do you want to talk about Miss Finch? Yeah, I do want to talk about Miss Finch, Hidden Valley Ranch, purveyor. Mm-hmm. I want to first off defend Miss Finch because she is saving a child who is sleeping in an alley. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Um, I, I know he has a mailbox. I know Maria will probably say, you know, he has a mailbox and he is a bird and he has got a nice nest, but he is still sleeping in an alley no matter what, what you yeah. tell me. Uh, Mrs. Finch, I remember her... Being oddly terrifying as a child. Yeah. yeah. And Tyler very, had a like, question. She's very like ostrich like. She's got like the stark brow. She's got the angry brow. eyes, to quote Mr. Yeah. Potato Head. She's got that that sharp lavender bob. And she's got a nanny, nanny from, she's got the wardrobe of nanny from Muppet Babies. Yes. Yeah. The, the stockings. Skirt, cardigan, sensible top. Yeah. It's, um, she is a little terrifying. She's kind of like the weasels from Roger Rabbit where she's just like in that big van and she just sort yeah. of pops up whenever Big Bird's finally singing, a, singing the end of a song. She always it's seems a, to show yeah. up during that last verse. It's a good villain. It's a good villain because you can sort of see her. She's clearly got a mission. 
and she thinks she's in the right, but also like it's like a very from a kid's perspective kind of vibe of this adult is trying to force me to do something I don't want to do. And right. she's very stern. She's very taciturn. But she's not um, she's not necessarily mean though. No, she's clearly mean she does mean well. She actually literally wants thinks it's important that Big Bird goes to a bird home, a loving bird yeah. home. And even though the dodos are idiots, mm-hmm. you know, that's her first attempt. It'd be a, you know, a foster home. It didn't work out, you know. I do think that that though how they like kill her on top of that dam and then her body falls into the the water below. I thought that was a little much cuz I again, like we said, I think she means well, so the fact that Big Bird, you know, and her were, you know, facing off gun to gun. Uh, I mean, I, and I she understand. was voiced by Tommy Lee Jones, but just in that scene, I which was also care. distracted. I I didn't mind the fall. It's just that they had to show her body being ripped to shreds. Yeah, hitting all the, the rocks hydrogen. below. Yeah, I just yeah. I just thought that was excessive. Uncalled for. Yeah. Maybe chopped in half, but it's a kid's movie, you know? Show her drowning. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too gory, just you yeah. know, slowly dying from inhaling water. I don't really have any insights. I just I just thought she was a good villain. No, she's good. And she, I mean, I like that she comes around at the end and uh, we yeah. learn what I would say is a muddled lesson. But uh, I yes. think I'll talk. I'll go ahead and talk about that, because this is probably my biggest qualm with this movie is the movie. Actually, after we meet the feathered friends and, and get our mission from Mrs. Finch as to what she's going to do, the, the plot gets in motion. We see uh, Big Bird on roller skates. Props to the late Carol Spinney on that, because I would never. I'd be like, go to hell, Jim Henson. You go to hell. I will (laughs) never. It's bad enough you've got me in this big feathery cage where I cannot see natural light. You've got me wearing these fucking orange and pink stockings. Now you want me to get on fucking bird-sized roller skates and just go (laughs) down a set? Fuck off. So Big Bird meets uh, another bird that lands on a light post, and... He's genuinely, like, excited to see another bird. Right. And is disappointed when he finds out that the bird's not going to stay in Sesame Street, that he's just passing through, which sort of lends credence to the uh, the reason that Miss Finch is heading to get him, which is he needs to be in contact with other birds. He needs to have bird right. friends and a bird family. So it sort of makes you go, oh, well, maybe he does need bird friends. Right. But then at the end of the movie... Uh, when Maria, when we're doing that panoramic shot of Maria, you know, saying he's got a family here, he's got a family of people and and cows and counts and what have you, uh, birds are not on that list. Right. Uh, there right. are no real other birds in in Sesame Street, so I was kind of confused as to what what I should take away from this. Like, if I buy into the metaphor, which I assume they're saying is like, maybe you're a kid of color in an all white community, or maybe you're of a different religion than the other people in your community or something like that, that you still, you should have some sort of contact with people like you, but not exclusively people like you, that it's good to have a diverse, you know, friend group, but he's still like at the end, he doesn't get that bird contact sticking with our metaphor that, that the the movie sort of made a case for at the beginning. So I was a little bit confused yeah. as to what I was supposed to be learning as a four-year-old child from this. Well, and and it, like it even in the beginning, Big Bird's like, Well, I have a home. Right. I'm happy here. And then he sort of gets convinced, partially because of his encounter with the bird, and then partially because Miss Finch convinces him that he needs his own kind. He's like, Oh, I guess I do. But it's also like he doesn't seem like you're right. He's kind of like reluctantly leaving at the right, beginning. Well, he's a kid, and these adults are like sort of telling him what he right. should do. Well, all, all I'm saying is that, like, yeah, it's it's al- already a reluctant. It's not like he got mad and like stormed away. Right. He just like was kind of like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm gonna go do this, and then immediately realized <laughs> it was a mistake. Yeah. Because the next thing I want to talk about is that the Dodos, who I I remember now because the little kid's name is Donnie, also my name growing up. Donnie Dodo, which was cruel that your dad would call you that your middle name is Dodo. Yeah, I think I vaguely remember that my sister picked up on that and uh, (laughs) began at least for some time calling me Donnie Dodo, which I'm sure I loved. The Dodos... Do- Donnie and Marie, and I believe Donnie is played by uh, oh, it's like the guy who played the nerd in Greece, Eddie Deason, I believe, plays Donnie, mm. Donnie Dodo. But okay. they're all terrible. They all, <laughs> they're all stupid. They're very kind-hearted, but they are Eddie dumb. Eddie Deason. 
Eddie Deason, yes. I believe he plays the nerd in Greece and a few other things. Okay. Also was in Punky Brewster. See? Yeah. Um, when Big Bird gets off the plane, they don't recognize that he is the Big Bird they are meeting. And she, she asks him, did you see any Big Birds on your flight? And he said, just me. And she goes, oh, well, maybe we, maybe he'll be on another flight. <laughs> and then my favorite thing, the first time I actually laughed out loud was that Big Bird writes a letter to everyone at yeah, Sesame Street. That. And he <laughs> mentions he mentions they have a lawnmower that you can ride around. And then he says, but I don't think they know how to use it yet. And you see da- Daddy Dodo set the lawnmower, and it's shot in a way that you just hear the lawnmower and see him from the chest up. But then you realize he is not on the lawnmower, and the lawnmower is just sort of rolled away. And then later... Later on, they go out to go to the pool, and this is like three minutes later. So it's like several cuts later. They go to go to their pool that they have in their backyard, and the lawnmower comes back, and they all start screaming and running away, and I laughed so hard. I love machines about to kill people. It makes me laugh. That genre is your favorite genre. <laughs> I, thought you I were love a running mention- gag, and I love machines about to kill people. I thought you were going to mention my favorite bit in the whole movie, which was when Big Bird gets a letter and he says, (laughs) he starts reading it to everyone. Dear Bird, it says, it goes on. (laughs) That was good. It's a very good delivery. He also, the mailman uh, delivers a, a the letter to him and says, are you big bird? Uh, I got a letter for you. And it's huge. It's massive. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the guy says, I hope you don't, I hope you don't get any packages. Cause, cause they would also be big. They'd be very big. Did you, were you put off by Snuffleupagus's just insistence that he was ready to visit? And it's like, Hey dude, I'm trying to like see how I fit into this family. Yeah. The whole social, Let settle in. social dynamic. There's a lot of like, you know, sibling politics. I got to work out with Donnie and Marie, show them that I am strong. I've already shivved Marie to show her I'm just fucking crazy. Uh, Find the biggest <laughs> sibling in your foster family and shift them. That's just, shift them. that's foster kid 101. That's how you get them. One more thing before I bring this up. I want to say, Big Bird snoring is probably the, the fourth best thing. fourth so best snoring in in pop culture. He is behind uh, tied for first Huey, Dewey and Louie and DuckTales right. have the best right, right. snoring, which is uh, Big Bird tucks his beak into his chest like a bird would and he does this weird like it's adorable. <laughs> he like does his little head shake. It's great. There's not enough comic snoring these days. Honk shoe, honk shoe. Love a honk shoe. As someone who's recently been observing the morning doves in our yard, they also (laughs) do a similar, like, they don't make that sound, obviously, but they do the little tuck in. Yeah, they do, like, sort of tuck their little... (laughs) Hey, you you like music, right? Love it. One of my Mm. favorite things. Let's talk about the music in Follow That Bird. Okay. What did you think of the music in Fall That Bird? I don't know how else to sort of lead you into this. We've you know, already referenced Ain't No Road Too Long, Outlaw yeah. Country Classic, because it's sung yeah. by Waylon. And then there's, I assume he was smoking a joint while while singing it. Yeah. I can't like remember the melody to any of the other ones, but there was like there were there was the flying upside down song, Bert and Ernie. There was in my upside down world. Yeah. Something oh, that's right. And something in mm-hmm. upside down girl. That's Billy Joel, actually. But <laughs> I mean, that's true. Upside down girl is a forgotten upside classic. Upside down girl. Um, and then there's this sad ass song he sings in the cage when he's painting. Oh blue. my god! I wrote down that bluebird song. Don't get any easier. Yeah. Uh. I, I know there was more, but th- those are the main ones I remember. Well, there's also that easy going song when they're oh, yeah. gardening. Easy going. I like that song. That was a they're cute good. song. They're good tunes. Yeah, they're fucking great. Well, I, I, they're good. Um, they're good. They're they're like a little, and I think it's intentional because it's a very young target audience. They're very like two main lines. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they're they're a little bit. If I'm being picky, if I were hearing them on the uh, on the old Spotify, I might <laughs> skip them only because it's like, okay, I get it. I think I but, got the gist. Kids on a farm with no adults. Yeah, but I think they're great. They've got good good melodies. They're good little. Uh, they add. I think they add to it. Ain't no road too long. I thought was a little long. 
It, that, it was like, oh, well, there ain't no road too long, but this song could use a fifth verse, someone yeah. said. Yeah. I do, I mean, that's that Bluebird song is a very simple song, but I think it's also compounded by the fact that, like, seeing Big Bird, who was my favorite Muppet as a kid, yeah. like, being literally caged, painted, painted against his blue. will, and yeah. singing, like, this, like, music box, like, minor key song while all these kids just stare at him while he has a sign beside him saying the bluebird of happiness. Like it's all like combines into this miasma of just heart wrenching sadness for me. It's really sad. I'm one of those people that has imagined myself meeting big bird. And I would imagine that I would just break down in tears immediately. And I don't know why (laughs) (laughs) you can't disappoint a picture, (laughs) but uh, that moment is very sad. And those kids watch, him be sad and they're like he doesn't seem too happy yeah it's so heartrending yeah. and he has like a blue tear that comes out of his eyes a muppet cries if a muppet cries does that make it real yes philip k dick he posed that very this. question yeah all the rest of my stuff is just highlights like i don't have any other big points i do here's one of my best points this was sort of a moment where i was like that is clever in a way that I never would have come up with. One, and near the end of the movie, uh, Olivia, they've all stopped at a gas station. All the, all the Muppet cars and various uh, people have stopped at a gas station, and Olivia comes up to the count, and she greets him, and she gives him a high five. And the minute I saw that, I was like, of course the count would want to be greeted with a high five, because <laughs> it's got a number in it. Do you it's get so it? fantastic. I kind of wish there was more of the friendship dynamic with Snuffleupagus and Big Bird, because that's like a central tenet of Big Bird, is that he has this this friend, Snuffy, with the terrifying eyes. Oh, those eyelashes, girl. You're going to need to... Yeah, Curl and we get out. a little bit of that, but because Snuff, Snuffleupagus can't go save him, he's just kind of like, he writes the letters, and he just kind of like talks like oh hey i can come i can come visit now but he doesn't I, take part in the road trip and i think that's a missed opportunity for as far as character goes it's probably logistically unsound but well it also uh i think at this time right? he was in a he was still yeah. considered big bird's imaginary friend right uh it, it wasn't until i Which think even sa- makes this story even sadder <laughs> his best friend is an imaginary how did he write the letter member. though I think he was still considered imaginary. I think they changed that shortly after for the reason that they didn't want kids to be afraid to tell adults something because the adult might not believe them. Oh. Which, when you think about that, when you put two and two together, you're like, yeah. oh, God. Uh, so they didn't like the idea that he, that Big Bird had an imaginary friend that he was telling everyone was real and they didn't believe him. Right. So, so they changed it, and Snuffy, I think, became officially part of this plane of existence, but only after the release of Follow That Bird. Okay. So he's still an imaginary friend at this time. But yeah, I, I agree with you that it probably would have been a great canon moment to make Snuffy real in the release of Follow That Bird. Well, and it was, it's also like it. Have him bust been... through the door and say, hey, you fuckers, here just, I am. I ain't real. I'm going to take a fucking dump on this street. Just beheading Donnie Dodo. <laughs> I remember distinctly the when Big Bird packs his suitcase, that bit. Oh I remember it. he keeps trying. He just puts like random stuff and then tries to pack he, a beach ball fully inflated. inflated. <laughs> beach ball? I didn't. I think I was annoyed by that as a kid, but I, it's very funny. At first I was like, well, I guess he's going to get all the essentials in here. But then no, he didn't because the nope. beach ball. The beach ball was, was the straw that broke the camel's back. I do want to point out one thing about the plane, two things about the plane. First off, it has some of the best legroom I've ever seen, that it could have an eight-foot bird in in the seats. And plus, the woman in front of Big Bird is reading Muscle and Fitness. (laughs) It was very odd. She didn't look uh, particularly like a a Muscle and Fitness uh, reader. And here we are. No slight to her, but it was just a... It's just an odd choice for just, <laughs> just give that woman a random magazine. Muscle and fitness. Did I say random magazine? Then that qualifies. Yeah. Just grab one off the coffee table there. When they show the overhead view of all of like the way to Ocean View, Illinois, they only highlight super odd named tiny towns. Like there's no like, <laughs> they go over Ohio and so there's Cincinnati and Columbus. It's all just like Bucksnort and whatever. I don't remember the names. But Toadstool is the Toadstool. town that's halfway between. Uh, yeah. That was great. Oceanside and and uh, and Sesame Toadstool Street. is where they have the mushroom parade, and we get my one of my favorite uh, other bits, which is the sign that says "Mushrooms are forever." <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? 
<laughs> what does it mean? It doesn't matter. It's great. We also get some good, a good amount of car humor because of this road trip. Uh, we get the sloppy jalopy, which is Oscar's car, right? I like the that that he has a car and it has a name. Yeah, uh, the Count's car has like bat badass. wing fins. It's awesome. It's awesome, and no one rides with the Count. Like, who wouldn't want to ride in the Count's like super villain car he's got? Yeah. It's amazing. It's like purple. It's like breathless mahoney purple. It's got these like old style fifties like fins, but they're like styled out like bat wings. It's amazing. Maria, ride with the Count. Just go in there. Send Cookie Monster over there because he ends up eating the entire car, which is very funny. I didn't know that that <laughs> yeah. was a thing. Cookie Monster isn't obsessed with cookies so much as literally he's a goat. He just eats everything. Yeah, he, he, I, yeah I don't know why they decided that his name, his moniker, will be related to cookies, but he will eat anything he can. But we'll specifically call him out on the cookie thing. It yeah, it's good. ludicrous, it and it was pretty funny when Susan got that car back when she when they were turned back to Sesame Street, and she didn't seem that bothered by it, honestly. Yeah, just, just a car. First off, I love a children's movie that has a Alfred Hitchcock reference in the middle of it, uh, which is uh, Big Bird runs from um, Bert and yeah. biplane, much like Cary Grant in North by Northwest, uh, which I loved. And then uh, there's a moment where Big Bird has an imaginary conversation with Snuffleupagus, and he says, I thought I'd never see you again. I can barely see you right now, because uh, <laughs> he was transparent. And I love a meta joke about how transparent people are people you imagine or ghosts or whatever. That's like a trope in movies. I'm like, who said ghosts are transparent, but movies did. And then forever they are transparent in our minds. Well, they're, you know, they're existing between two planes, Damon. This is just, it's, that's just science. We get a little cameo from Chevy Chase as the newscaster. And then Kermit the frog as the Kermit the frog (laughs) as the reporter. And they don't, it's not, particularly funny but it's good to see them both kermit's reporting on the the missing the missing the missing bird uh from oceanside illinois although i thought he was just sesame street news that was canon when i was growing up but what do i know you know i mean he's he's picking up freelance gigs it's it's uh, (laughs) reagan's economy um didn't trickle down to kermit and my favorite well, press you know the liberal yeah. leaning sesame street it's media true. also another really good bit is when they all come to rescue big bird in the cage and they're trying to be quiet because the sleaze brothers are sleeping in the same room and he just can't he's like it's so good to see you <laughs> and they're like they're like oh we're sure. and he just can't do it it's it's he very can't cute. stop talking because he's a child it's very cute did you know that like obviously it's it's set up very clearly in this movie that big bird is six years old and he's he's a child and he needs you know he needs a family or whatever but like did you know that i always pictured big bird as like an adult and this and this movie is what made me confused about it because i was like oh you thought it was just sort of like a, a chipper sort he's of a, dim he's a adult. puppet. You know what I mean? He's yeah. an age ageless, but not that he was an adult, but that he was just a It's hard to see age in, in puppets, as we already yeah. discussed with Telly just a few minutes ago. Right. How old uh, are Bert and Ernie? I mean, they have an apartment, so I don't know. They've got kept all those pigeons. That seems like that seems like a lot for, for kids. They're, they're nesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I did understand that that Bert w- or a uh, Big Bird was a child. Technically, I don't know. I don't know why I know that, but yeah, I think it I, doesn't really I matter. Did but it's just like it's it's never that explicit until this movie, I guess, or maybe yeah. it is, and I just didn't remember, which is totally possible. But this movie is like he's six years old. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. His birthday is this day. Yeah, <laughs> which means he's now one hundred and six years old. <laughs> He's an Aquarius. Well, I just wanted to... First off, Big Bird, you live in an urban area. What? Do the fucking pigeons do good for you? You can't fucking talk to the pigeons? Yeah, talk to birds There's your pigeons. fucking bird f- friends. Yeah. Jesus, just because they eat trash, you can't talk to them suddenly. Just because they're disgusting flying rats. But I do want to... Like, there's part of me that, as, as a kid... I never picked up on it because, you know, I just have a higher thought process than most. And I'm just like really aware of, you know, sociopolitical issues. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. it's really kind of amazing when you see like the cast of the TV show, like go into a movie and you're like, there, it's like a crazy diverse cast that you don't see. There are three 
there are three black people in the main cast that are like Gordon from Sesame Street. It's like pretty much I am the human face of Sesame Street for right. the most part. Yeah. And Luis and Maria, like I remember when they got married when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. That was a big deal. Linda is deaf. And so like her being deaf yeah. is never treated as a burden, but it's always like this thing of like we need to make sure that Linda is included and they 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 sign very casually in the show. It's like amazing that this was a show that they Debuted in 1969 with pretty much the same cast. Yeah. 1969, what I like to refer to as the summer of five years after the Civil Rights Act. And that <laughs> like that permeated through my childhood of just like seeing these people on a day-to-day basis, and I'm just a white kid from Whiteville, I think we can all agree. And <laughs> like I didn't think anything of it. It was it's amazing. And I feel like sometimes you just are so used to it that you right. don't feel the need to commend it. But I want to commend like Sesame Street is kind of awesome in that it didn't make yeah. a big deal out of it. It was just like here we are. We're in an urban area. And so it's gonna be a very diverse group of people. And that's like sort of the theme of this show as well, is not just like the species diversity of Sesame Street where there are right. cows and, and, and people talking, hanging out, or cows and grouches or whatever, but also like a diverse set of people yeah. all living in like harmony and learning their ABCs together. And now they're... Learning they to are... count in Spanish. Did you catch Elmo at the end? No. Was he in the party? He was at the end when like uh, they're all like cheering for Big Bird to be back. He like pops out of a window. It's before Elmo was Elmo. Right. And he was just like this leftover puppet. But yeah, he was there. Consolidating political power. <laughs> he was building up. <laughs> He's doing those. Ba- this is still the the backroom deal part of his rise to power. Exactly. Just a yeah. bunch of white guys with cigars, uh, yeah. and then he'll he'll talk to the Senate, uh, and they'll try yeah. to crown him emperor. And he'll refuse two times, but on the third time, he will accept the crown. And that's yeah. when Big Bird realizes he has to stab him on the steps of One Two Three Sesame Street. Let's go to the verdict. Okay. There ain't no road no, too do long. long. Um, Damn it. Xanthopolis. Yes. What is your verdict? This Follow movie's that. great. It's a very charming movie. Muppets are fun. It's fun to see Muppets. It's fun to see Muppets in peril. Uh, it's fun to have songs. It's a very charming movie. I was charmed. It was, yeah, it was great. I laughed. I was surprised that I actually laughed out loud several times, uh, which is saying something for, like, this isn't just a children's movie. Like, this is, like, a children's Yes, this movie. is for young children. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't like Roger Rabbit where it's, like, a children's movie, but hang out. There's a few boob jokes in it. Right. This is, like, a children's movie, and it yeah. was very enjoyable and, and uh, charming. So I loved it. You're in a Child is Not an Idiot. You're Good job, a ch- yeah. Children's Television Workshop. Agreed. Your inner child is not an idiot. This is great. Uh, like, I, if you, you could totally show this to your kids now, and I think there's nothing in it that's, like, problematic, which is rare, especially in things that we watch. Maybe something, I guess, <laughs> I guess the fact that Elmo's in it and uh, you could extrapolate Kevin Clash, but, like... But he doesn't even say anything. I don't even think he has the Elmo voice yeah. yet. There, I, I picked up all kinds of things that, I, even though I love this movie and wore it out on VHS, I picked up on all kinds of things I didn't realize... Even not like they were, like you said, like not crazy adult jokes or anything, but just like goofy things, funny things being like, oh, hey, that guy's from SCTV. I didn't know what SCTV was when I was five. You weren't following Canadian comedy as a yeah, child? Fucking not yet. I pedant. didn't get that. First, I got into karate, then fighter pilots, then Canadian <laughs> comedy, then comic books, then music. Natural uh, growth of a child. Yeah. Then lava lamps. And now I've been into lava lamps ever since. It's great. And I, I was actually, I wasn't expecting us to like hate this, but I, I was expecting it to have aged. I don't know. I don't know. Like not, not in an inappropriate sense, but just kind of be like, I don't know, dawdling and boring and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was like, like you said, it's definitely aimed at children. And that's obvious in the construction of every bit of it. But at the same time, it was like, I enjoyed watching it. <laughs> and it yeah. was, it was amusing. And the, the songs are, are uh, catchy and Dave Thomas, you know, Dave Thomas. What do you think everybody? Email us, your inner child is an idiot at gmail.com. You can text us or leave us a voicemail, 615-576-0525. You can find us on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, probably some others that we don't know about that uh, have pirate accounts, you know? (laughs) 
Who um, is pirating our account? Just pirate our actual account. Just I'd, actually, could you just handle our posting? We're yeah, very bad want, at social media. If you media. want a social media vod job, just fucking here. I'll give you the fucking password. You can support our show by going to patreon.com slash you and your child is an idiot. We want to thank our current patrons of the show, including Just Cuz. My neighbor burrito. The Zesty. Jacob Grimm. Particle Man. Jonathan Day. Demon's Australian accent. Uh, Heather Tuggle. Dramatically placed hot dog. Karen Curd. Larissa P. Maestro. I just gave her a middle <laughs> initial. I don't think that's right. She's earned it. Uh, <laughs> Lindsay P. Nell. T. T. Smith. <laughs> Jeremy P. Pallon. <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> But where Kev- are you going to place it? That's what I'm excited to find out. Kevin, Kevin from Cleveland, P. Ah, uh, oh, didn't see it coming. Captain Jean-Luc P. Picard. Brandon P. Hardy. His Honor P. The Mayor. The Supreme Ruler of this P. Podcast. The P also stands for podcast. And Dan <laughs> Mac P. Entire. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. And there ain't no road too long. Thank you for not singing the Bluebird song because I'll just start sobbing. And there ain't no road. Oh, here he's reaching. Careful. Brought it from home. He went home to get it. Wait. And there ain't no road. Too long. Uh, 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 this is great. It's fun to watch the process. Uh, 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 uh